This lecture is going to help us learn how to use our term symbols in order to assign electronic transitions and use what we refer to as correlation diagrams. So a couple of questions we hope to be able to answer from this lecture. Um, one, if we have a metal complex, and can we predict how many peaks we expect to see in the UV visible spectrum? Um, why are the peaks so broad as shown here? And this one we might already have an answer to. Why do different peaks differ in intensity with metal ligand and structure? How do we calculate delta octahedral for our complex? And a lot of these answers are going to come from a diagram that looks like this, which is a type of correlation diagram that we need to learn how to use. So to start out, we can consider the simple case of if we have a D1 metal, and one of the things we learned to do in a previous lecture was say if we have a D1 metal, we should be able to identify the ground state term, and we can do that by find out it's a doublet D state. Now, this is for a metal ion, but what we are now dealing with is a metal complex. And so we know once we have ligands bound to our metal, the 5D orbitals are no longer degenerate. And so we now have to take that into consideration with our ground state term and our excited terms as well. And so when we do this, we know there's two possibilities. And instead of using a atomic term symbol to des describe the electronic state, what we have to go to instead is a molecular term symbol. Um, and a couple things about these, when we talk about the molecular term symbols, the first thing to know is the spin multiplicity will be conserved. So we have a doublet state here because we have a single unpaired electron. So our molecular term symbol will also have to be doublet because we're going to have the same number of unpaired electrons. The second thing is the in this case, the letter D came from our atomic quantum numbers. Um, and in our molecular term symbol, the symbol that's going to take the place of D is actually going to be a symmetry label. So this will look a little familiar at first. And so if we think about our two cases of a D1 system, we could say, well, we could either put the electron in the T2G slot, this would be our ground state, or we could put it in the EG slot, and this would be our excited state. So the ground state term symbol of this first D1 case is called doublet T2G. And again, that T2G symmetry label just means we have one electron in the T2G set. And our excited state is doublet EG because we have one electron in the EG set. So if we wanted to talk about the electronic transition, we could write this electronic transition and we would actually write it as doublet EG and then we draw an arrow to the EG state from the doublet T2G. Typically, when you write these electronic transitions, you put the higher energy orbital first, and then the arrow shows you the direction of the electron movement. So this would be an excitation. All right, so about that correlation diagram. So in our correlation diagram, very similar to our crystal field, what we have is we're going to start with our atomic term, and we have zero energy would be here on the y-axis. And so what this is saying, this is your free ion. And what we're going to do is we're going to increase the ligand field strength. We're increasing the crystal field. And so what happens, and again, this is just like our crystal field. We're starting with five degenerate orbitals. And as we increase the crystal field, we're going to start to look more and more like our crystal field diagram where we split into the T2G and the EG set. And so... We have our free iron, our strong field, and so our, our correlation diagram would look like this. The stronger the bond strength, the lower in energy the T2G, and the higher in energy our doublet EG state would be. On this diagram, then, we can identify our delta octahedral, as shown there. Um, and this would be our correlation diagram for a D1 system. All right. We could jump ahead to a now D1 tetrahedral system, All right? So now we just went from octahedral to tetrahedral, and we can think about the symmetry labels involved. Remember, for a crystal field diagram of a tetrahedral system, the EG set is lower in energy, and the T2 set is higher in energy. And so within this system, the ground state is called doublet E, the excited state is doublet T2, and so our correlation diagram, and in this case, delta T, 
ground state doublet E going to the doublet T2. One thing to take note is this is the inverse of the octahedral case, and that's going to be useful for us um, as we continue to examine these complexes. So let's quickly jump ahead to the D9 case. So the other extreme where we have all electrons filled except for one in our D orbitals. Um, so here's our atomic state. Notice the same starting term symbol of doublet D um, because this is the same symmetry. Whereas before in the D1, we had one electron and nine holes. Here we have one hole and nine electrons. So it's actually the same overall symmetry. Um, when we look at this case, we can then say we have a missing electron in the in the T2G set, and in the excited state, we have a missing electron in the EG set. So when we go to assign our term symbols in our symmetry labels, one of the things we can notice by symmetry is this first set has the same symmetry as the excited state of our D1 complex because it's nine things and one thing missing. And so our overall, remember go back to our D1, here's our two term symbols, the lower energy was T2 doublet T2G, higher energy doublet EG, and in this case, it's reversed. The lower energy state is doublet EG. So again, why is that? It's because this symmetry, we can say this symmetry and this symmetry are the same. Here we have a single electron, in the excited state and here we have a single hole in the excited state and then everything else is the same so with our correlation diagram again what this is going to look like for a d9 case is shown here where the excited state is double t2g and the lower energy state is double eg so a couple notes we can now make on this is when we think about these correlation diagrams we see that within an octahedral case whatever dn is, it's actually the inverse of d10 minus n. So d1 and d9 are inverse diagrams of each other. We can also see that with respect to the tetrahedral case, the tetrahedral is the same as the d10 minus n, or the tetrahedral is the inverse of the dn case. All right. So let's go back to our little bit more complicated example where we had a d2. So now we have two d electrons. The presence of that second electron does a lot to complicate our lives. And we can see one of the things that comes out of it is we no longer have a single atomic term symbol to deal with, but rather we have five atomic term symbols. And so we have to understand one, what the ground state is. We found that that's our triplet F state. And then we have to think about when we put this into the crystal field, what happens to the degeneracy of all of these states? And you can kind of look this up in tables. Um, and we can see that that F state is actually going to seven states and it's going to split into three different terms. A P state would split into one term that's triply degenerate and so on. But we can look at this correlation diagram and here's what the correlation diagram would look like. All right. So again, we're starting with our triplet F state, which splits into three terms in terms of our ligand field strength. And then in this case, our triplet P just stays as one term, the triplet T1G case. Um, these, this is a simplified correlation diagram. And what chemists did is they made these diagrams a little bit better by adding some complexity to things. And also you'll notice this ground state term in this case is the triplet T2G. Um, it would be nice if this was sort of a horizontal line going across of a constant energy. And so we can normalize that as well. And so Chemists did that by taking into consideration energy values and repulsions, and they came up with what's known as Tanabe-Sugano diagrams. These are correlation diagrams that depict the energies of electronic states of complexes as a function of the strength of the ligand field. With these diagrams, these are the diagrams that allow us to calculate delta octahedral and assign electronic transitions. The first thing you should know is you can always look these up. We'll never recreate these diagrams. We can just look them up. They're only for octahedral DN complexes, which means for the tetrahedral, we have to understand we use the re inverse diagram. And if we're looking at D4 through D7, we have a complication of we can either have a high spin or low spin complex. And so we'll have to take both of those into consideration. Um, so here's our diagram we looked at in the previous slide. And what is, we can take this and change it into our Tanabe-Sagano diagram, which is going to look like this. 
These are a lot more complicated and we can notice a bunch of things. We can look at the axes. We can see a bunch of different lines. Again, we can look these up. We will learn how to read these and how to predict transitions. So the first thing I'll draw your attention to is the energies, the axes. Both axes are in terms of energies. Your y-axis is energy over B and your x-axis is delta octahedral over B. So again, delta octahedral is built into this. And then you have this B function. Um, B is what's known as the Raka parameter. It's an empirical constant. Um, we'll often have to figure that out en route to calculating delta octahedral. All right. The x-axis is delta octahedral over B, as we said. And so this is going to keep our ground state term constant. So when we think, start thinking about electronic transitions, we're always going to start from this ground state term. So in this case, triplet T1. And then we'll ask ourselves, which line, which electronic state can we go to? What are the viable electronic transitions? And that's going to come from our selection rules. Um, another uh, small point to make is what's known as the non-crossing rule, which just says two terms of the same symmetry can't cross. So if they approach, they'll bend. That's why you start to see some of these lines bending away from each other in various cases. And that's why not all of them are straight. So let's learn how to read these diagrams. And this comes back to our selection rules. Um, you can review your physical chemistry for a better understanding of these rules. Um, we'll just jump right to the rules. There's two real rules that sort of tell us which electronic transitions are allowed. Um, the first is what's known as a spin selection rule. And that says that transitions between different multiplicities is forbidden. So for example, we are allowed to start at quartet A2 and go to quartet T1. That's an allowed electronic transition. But what we cannot do is have a ground state quartet A2 and become excited to doublet A2. The multiplicity has changed, and that is a forbidden transition. The second selection rule is the Laporte selection rule, and that says transitions between states of parity, which means symmetry with respect to the center of inversion, U or G, are forbidden. What that says is you cannot go from a grata to a grata orbital, or you can't go from an ungrata to ungrata orbital. Right. Another thing that says, since d orbitals are all grata, a d to d transition is actually forbidden by quantum mechanics. All right. So we're going to have to think about this point in a second of how we kind of get around that rule. So let's talk about that forbidden transition, the d to d. Most metal complexes, the color is a result of a d to d transition but we just said on the previous slide that this is technically a Laporte forbidden transition. So how does this happen? When we think about what that forbidden word means, it does mean it quantum mechanically is impossible. Um, but as we'll see in a second, uh, maybe a better working definition is um, we can get around the quantum mechanical rule. And so forbidden means unlikely to happen as opposed to it will never happen. And so one way we can get around it is through something like a tetrahedral complex. A tetrahedral complex has no center of inversion, and so none of the orbitals would have ungrata or grata labels, and so that means the D-to-D -D transition is now okay to happen. Another way we can do it is decrease symmetry of our octahedral complex. So if we look at two examples, we can look at a D4H complex. This has a center of inversion, so the D-to-D -D would be grata to grata, and it would be a forbidden transition. But for example, in this case, where we've destroyed the center of inversion, and now we have our C2V point group, there's no Gs, no Us in our orbitals. And so that D to D transition is allowed in this case. And so we've removed the symmetry with our structure. The final way we can have a D to D transition is through distortions and vibrations. Um, our molecule is constantly vibrating, and at any given state, if you vibrate in a bond, for example, if this bond stretches out, that will destroy our center of inversion in the molecule. We can have a quick electronic excitation um, from this system with no inversion, and then the molecule can vibrate back and restore the center of inversion. Um, so through those vibrations, 
we can actually get around the forbidden transition from of a G to G. Um, and that's something to kind of keep in mind how this happens. That does have an effect on the intensity of our transition. And one of the things we'll see is the intensity of a transition or the molar absorptivity, which really tells us that intensity, tells us something about the, the selection rules of that transitions. Generally, Laporte forbidden transitions are stronger intensity than spin forbidden. So with these selection rules, we can think about the intensity and that molar absorptivity or the extinction coefficient, if you want, it gives us information about the type of electronic transition occurring. Um, so for example, if you are a transition that's both spin forbidden and Laporte forbidden, it's gonna have an extinction coefficient of less than one. Now what that means is in a UV vis, that's gonna be very, very weak and very hard to see because it's such a weak transition to happen. The Laporte allow, or the spin allowed, but Laporte forbidden, like a D to D transition that has the delta G or the grata label, um, this is gonna have extinction coefficient of about 10. So we're gonna be able to see these. These are still gonna be nice and colorful, um, but it's still a fairly weak transition. If we destroy the symmetry in our molecule, um, we're still a D to D transition, but we have no grata labels. Now we're gonna have an extinction coefficient of about 100. And if we're truly spin and Laporte allowed by quantum mechanics, then we can see our extinction coefficient is huge. So on our UV vis spectrum, if we could see all of these, this peak would drown out all the other peaks if present. And again, this peak would be much more intense than this peak. And this peak is almost hidden in the noise at times, very, very hard to see. All right. So we can look at a quick spectrum just to sort of give you an idea of how we utilize these. This is for a D9 complex. And so we can see it's a very pretty blue color of this hexa aqua copper two complex. So a D9 complex, we can look at this and we can start to assign the peaks. One of the things you'll notice right away is the Y axis is not absorption. It's instead the extinction coefficient. So through the use of Beer's law, we can make a couple measurements at a couple different concentrations. And we can actually change this axis from absorption to molar absorptivity. That's really useful for us because now we can read something on this scale um, that'll tell us directly about the type of transition that's taking place. And we can say take the peak of the of the, the top of the peak, come over here to the y-axis, and we can see our extinction coefficient is about 11. Um, and that tells us that this is a spin allowed Laporte forbidden transition, which we should expect for a D9 complex because we can think about that electronic transition as starting in the doublet EG state and being excited to the doublet T2G state. So that's a little bit about how we can start to understand correlation diagrams and use them to assign electronic transitions. Stay tuned to determine how to actually calculate delta octahedral and assign electronic transitions in more complicated systems.